Hello everyone. My apologies, I don't think the monitor here likes Linux, so I'm just using uh, Alexa's laptop. Thank you for that. So my name is Nick Vidal. I work with the OSI, the Open Source Initiative, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Alexi, for the invitation. And so today we're going to talk about open source AI. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about open source AI, but there's no clear definition of what's actually open source AI. In fact, uh, there's the European AI Act that has been progressing rapidly in Europe. And over there on this legal document, they stay free and open source AI. But nowhere in this legal document do they actually define what's open source AI. So the OSI is working together with the community to try to come up with a definition. And this slides here, uh, I'm going to go over an overview of what's actually uh, AI, generative AI. And so I'll pass through qu quickly here. So uh, this is uh, stable diffusion uh, from stability uh, AI. And this is a question, what if Elon Musk was living on Mars? <laughs> This one here, what if Wall E, the Disney character, was a real human person? And these are some amazing uh, images created by generative AI. Next, we have the Joker as a Disney princess. This, is, this one is a bit scary. <laughs> and finally, Harry Potter surfing at the beach. So all this was created using open source and generating uh, those images. And it's quite amazing how it was able to generate that, right? It's uh, groundbreaking. Uh, so we have the diffusion model. We also have uh, other models, right? Like uh, attention and transformers. And so what is generative AI? Basically we have a prompt where we enter text or we enter image or whatever and it generates a response so here we have what's the capital of germany and using those large language models it's going to respond the capital of germany is berlin all right uh, generally uh, this is the diagram of how this works uh, basically so we have uh, a prompt where somebody asks a question uh, and this goes to an application. Let me see if I can. All right. And uh, this uh, is going to go, going to ask the large language model to see if there's a response. And uh, to create this large language model, we use a training data, a, a huge amount of data. And this is going to return a response to the user. All right. Uh, you, besides using a training data, you can also uh, do some fine tuning to uh, adapt this large language model to use cases. So for example, we have, we can adapt this large language model to generate a, a programming language codes, right? Or to a question and answer type of uh, chat style or any other specific task for medical uh, research as well or other topics. Another uh, form of uh, enhancing this is by using prompt engineering or RAG where you can use live documents or li live data and uh, when you use a prompt it's going to seek if there's something more recent or uh, something more precise using embedding and it's going to work with the large language model and return a result that's much more precise. So this is the basic diagram for a generative AI. Um, and let's go, the, uh, this is very generic. It works for both proprietary models and open source models, but let's dive into what's actually open source AI. And what's interesting here is that we can break this into four components. So we have the software. The software is the easiest part. We know, we clearly know what's open source software or what's not. 
uh, there's uh, at least 25 years of history behind this uh, using the OSI uh, licenses, but much more than that, the free software movement that started before uh, it has the four freedoms, so it can uh, clearly explain if uh, if a software is actually free and open source software or not. So this is uh, the basics, right? Uh, software is very well defined. However, with data, this is more challenging because the data, there's uh, some privacy issues, there's uh, copyrights around data. Sometimes you cannot release, fully release the, the data or the data sets. Uh, so there are some challenges around that, right? Uh, maybe it's under Creative Commons and you have to give attribution. How does that work for large language models? There's also the model architecture and the weights as well. So when uh, Yama was launched, uh, the, the first version, the weights were only shared with researchers. And th these weights got leaked on 4chan so people started using Yama, even though they couldn't uh, basically use the weights, uh, even if there were not researchers, because this got leaked, right? Uh, we know that there's a, a whole community around open, open models, right? Open source models. So Hugging Face, we can see here the leadership board where we have a, a whole bunch of models coming up every week or every day. It's very challenging to keep up with all the news happening. So this is pretty exciting. And also there, there was a, a leaked um, document from an engineer at Google where they say that they see that open source is really growing uh, and outpacing proprietary models. We're not there yet, but even though your company might have the best engineers, the best team, it's very challenging to compete with a global community of developers, of researchers, and so, and also this iteration that everyone can develop on top of other models. So this, uh, this document basically says that open source will outpace proprietary models and Google or OpenAI don't have a moat, right? And we were seeing this happening, this rapid innovation and iteration. And so what's happening is that we see that we're, um, companies like OpenAI and other organizations are trying to uh, create a, a regulation uh, difficulty for startups, right? Make it really challenging for startups to, to obey all the laws and all the regulations. So only the big players will be able to play this game. But we've seen a lot of uh, companies also trying to uh, promote a, a more innovative uh, a s scene, right? So we have Hugging Face, for example, or Stability AI, who have written uh, uh, letters to Congress, to the American Congress, to promote uh, open source AI. Uh, recently, uh, Meta launched Yama2. It's not open source. <laughs> OSI created a, a published a, an article explaining why Yama2 is not open source. But Yama2 is one of the most open models that there is. Uh, it's almost open source, right? And it's uh, being rapidly uh, being adopted. Uh, and we also see a question around privacy. Uh, when you use uh, OpenAI, when you use ChatGPT, companies are basically giving away their data to a third party. And so we've seen Apple, Goldman Sachs, Samsung uh, prohibiting the use of ChatGPT because of those questions. When you use open source AI, when you use open models, you can have this on-prem. And so your data does not get leaked for companies, uh, startups, or even large companies, having your own uh, large language models running on-prem or using privacy enhancing technologies running in the clouds is mu makes much more sense. It's much better because you have a lot of sensitive data. 
you don't want to give that away, right? So here are some advantages of using open source AI. So the transparency of the data, the data that, you're, uh, that you use for training or for fine tuning, this is very much transparent. When you, have, uh, when you have a proprietary model, you don't know what has been used to train that data or to fine tune that data, right? There's also a question of independence. You're not dependent on a company making changes to those models. If you want to fine tune that, if you want to change the direction of those models with open source, you can do that. Also security, it's much more secure. You, you don't have to talk with a third party. You can run this on-prem or on privacy enhancing technologies on the clouds. And finally, customization. You have total control over the data, over the model, uh, over the software. So it's much more customizable. Uh, other advantages as well, it allows for this fast iteration, collaboration with a global community, and uh, it's just more diverse, right? We see this happening uh, at Hugging Face, models uh, that are being created week after week, right? And it's very difficult to actually keep up with all this innovation. And finally, other advantages. It allows for an easier interoperability because since it's open source, you can integrate it with your own systems. It allows for a, co a cost reduction, especially at large scale. If you run OpenAI and ChatGPT can be quite expensive if you're running this uh, like several thousands API calls. But if you're running this uh, as, your own, as part of your own infrastructure at, at a large scale, it makes much more sense. And also performance because uh, you don't have the, the latency of uh, transmitting that data back and forth. You're, you're running this close to, to your data, right? So these are some advantages of open source. And also, um, uh, I found this uh, interesting uh, tweet by Ahmed, who's the CEO of Stability AI. Uh, this is a, a company that's value at 4 billion. And it says here, uh, for people asking, but how are open, so open models going to make money for business, right? Imagine this, every government, every institution, every company, every one of those is going to have a model, an open model that's audible in the future, hopefully, right? This is like a, tr uh, a trillion dollar market. How can we enable that? How can, and this is, has a huge potential, right? So uh, basically, uh, as a conclusion, comparing proprietary models and comparing open, model, open models, uh, open models offer a whole bunch of uh, advantages. There's no data leakage. You have privacy and security. You can customize uh, everything. It's not restrictive. It's not a black box. It's more transparent. It doesn't have a locking. It's much more et heterogeneous, more diverse. It's not homo homogeneous, right? So open source offers a lot of advantages. And so as part of the OSI, we really believe in open source. And there has been a lot of talk about open source AI and what exactly that is. And we are working to actually define what's open source AI. So we have created the, what's interesting is that the OSI does not define what's open source software. It's a community consensus. What the OSI does is bring together a whole bunch of communities of developers, researchers, to try to come up with a definition of what's open source software. And we're doing the same process for open source AI. We're bringing together several communities. We're uh, working uh, with uh, nonprofits like the Linux Foundation uh, and Wikimedia and a whole bunch of other organizations and um, trying to come up with a definition. And why is that important? When we have this clear definition, it allows for
for uh, companies, organizations to clearly understand how they can use those open source models. We need that. And just how open source has an open source software has enabled companies and organizations to benefit from open source. We're trying to do the same for open source AI. So let me try to come up with, let me try to open the uh, a tab here. Can I, can I open a tab? All right. I think it moves around with me. see it. Do you usually just bring up a URL and then yeah. move the screen? Yeah. That's okay. Right. Yeah, you can just bring up a URL and move it to the right. Right. So this is the URL, uh, opensource.org slash deep dive, where we're working together with the community to create, with a, create a definition of what's actually open source AI. And this has been pretty exciting. We are, So this started in June. We had a meeting at the Mozilla headquarters where we gathered uh, about 15 people to start those discussions. Um, and later we had a, a community review in Portland uh, together with uh, FOSSI. We were also as part of the Linux Foundation Open Source Congress in Geneva, in Switzerland. We're, we're going to be next week holding uh, the deep dive webinars online, and this is very exciting. We're here in Bilbao to have those discussions, uh, to have a, a review of the definition. And we next month, we're going to be at All Things Open in North Carolina to have uh, the first release candidates of this definition of what's open source AI. And we're after we have this release candidate, we're going to put this online and allow people to comment around those changes. And hopefully by 2024, we hope to have a clear definition so that it will help everyone uh, have a clear understanding of what's open source AI. Uh, we have this webinar series that's happening next, next week uh, after Bilbao. And we have a whole bunch of uh, very interesting speakers from the Ellen Turing Institute, and other organizations. So everyone's welcome to join. And so that's it. I open to questions and thank you so much for being part of that. Yeah. A quick question. You said there's a community review happening in Bilbao. Where is that happening? So right here, uh, okay. I'm hoping to have those discussions okay. and I'm going to show a draft uh, of the, this uh, definition of open source AI. And I hope to uh, connect with each one of you one-on-one -on -one, uh, to have those discussions. So feel free to, <laughs> to reach out to me. <laughs> Thanks. Is the draft at that link on the open source.org deep dive? Uh, it's not there yet. We have a small group that we're working and we're going to have this official release candidates 
at all things hoping. Yeah, right. but I'll be happy to share with you. Each okay. One. Yeah. So you can share it privately, one on one. Yeah. For feedback. Got it. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, uh, David. My question is this: uh, Since the uh, large language model today is very expensive to exactly. train, yeah. So I'm wondering how open source kind of a large language model can sustain to the big proprietary mm -hmm. like uh, Llama and things beyond that. Uh, that's a question that uh, basically is uh, how uh, relevant mm -hmm. of this open source uh, large language model in terms of uh, cap capability compared to this mm -hmm. uh, those proprietary due to the very expensive of those training uh, resource. That's my question. Yeah. And secondly, is that the license model is seem to be uh, those available one is getting changed to the non-commercial based mm -hmm. uh, license, right? You can see the train on uh, hawking faces. Yeah. So that means um, what if this you come from scratch is very expensive. And then the, if you want to derive from the, those proprietary, that also uh, become, you know, very restrict. Yeah. So how do you foresee that open source uh, large language model can head down the road? Yes. So that's a very good question. Indeed, it's very expensive to uh, create a foundational model. But we do have some organizations like Lion or Eleo for AI, we, which we are in contact with, which are organizations that are uh, either they, ha they have support from governments or other uh, sponsors who are um, allowing them to use GPUs or for training rights. So it is a challenge, but um, it's finding a way, <laughs> basically finding a way. Also, we are seeing that sometimes larger does not mean it's better, right? We're seeing smaller large language models, or shall, shall we call it small language models, <laughs> that are uh, just as good or sometimes even better than uh, those foundational models uh, that are very large because they're very focused on an area, like for example, healthcare or uh, finance or whatever. W the quality of the data is really important. And sometimes you, when you focus on that, uh, it's cheaper to, to create those models and it, sometimes it's better as well. So we're seeing that. Uh, regarding your, your second question, yes, we do have uh, those challenges. Uh, and this is something that we have to, to help define and help understand uh, around the licenses and how we can make it more open while respecting all the other challenges like copyrights and privacy. And so this is an open challenge that we have to, to come up with. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? I have a question, Nick. So, so you compare proprietary models to open source models, right? And kind of the hypothesis is that you will have, you know, municipalities, hospitals will have these open source models, mm -hmm. and you say the advantage is there's no data leakage. But if you deploy a model on prem, you have multiple users, mm -hmm. there still can be leakage in turn between yeah. the users, right? So, yeah. uh, and also it, what I'm also wondering about, uh, and I think it's a hard problem, I wonder what your thoughts are. So let's say a hospital trains mm -hmm. a model, right? And like on the use cases, obviously they will have patient data. So you exactly. cannot have all of that model being open source available. Mm -hmm. Like it may be based on open source technologies. Yeah. It may run on open source tools, but I don't, no, if you want this model to be available for inspection for anyone mm -hmm. who wants to see it. So how do we define, because model now has chunks of data in it, right? And so how do you uh, wrap, like what's the community thinking given what you start in June, right? Like how do we have an open source model which encapsulates sensitive data, right? 
how do you kind of distinguish between sensitive data and model and what does it mean to be open source if you cannot give this data yeah. to anybody who asks for it yes so this is one of the limitations of large language models and we're seeing more and more uh, a combination of large language models with knowledge graph and uh, reg prompt engineering to allow a better access control right so uh, when you have very sensitive data probably you don't want to have that as part of the model you want to have that uh, either uh, in a knowledge graph or somewhere where you can have a better control over this data and this is the direction they were seeing happening yeah uh, thank you yeah. any other questions tim do you see anything on the live stream mentions i think we have a couple a few people on the live stream and i didn't see questions yet <laughs> Okay, right, great. Right. Thank you, Nick. All right, thank you so much. Thanks.